Once again, I'd like to bring you an illustration showing one of the great doctrines found in God's Word, the Bible. Today, I'd like to draw for you a picture on deliverance from sin. Deliverance from sin. Now, when I speak of sin, I'm talking about a term that is familiar to all my listeners. You know something about sin. Sin is a common term. It's used in advertising. It's used in publicity. It's used in movies. It's used in magazines. You know something about sin, every one of you. For the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You may not have had as much experience in sin as some other people have had. Maybe you don't know as much about sin as I do. Maybe you know more. Maybe you know less. But there's one thing that it is certainly true. You know something about sin. You're bound to. For the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There isn't anyone in this world that hasn't had some experience with sin. You can argue about the Bible. You can read the silly superstitious scholars that write articles on the contradictions in the Bible. And you can believe a lot of things you pick up here and there. And you can find fault with many things that Christian people stand for. But there's one fact you can't argue with. There's one fact about which there is no disputation. Sin. You know something about it. Somewhere sin has crossed your life. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why, if you were to line up tonight the great men and women of this world, men and women that are supposedly great in the eyes of people, why, if you were to line them up across this board tonight, or in this studio, or in your own living room, line up... Uh, Gloria the Haven, Richard Whitbart, Bert Lancaster, Groucho Marx, uh, George uh, Goebel, uh, President Eisenhower, ex-President Truman. If you were to line them up here tonight, the popes, the generals, the leaders of this world, if you were to line them up tonight, there wouldn't be one of them that sin could not approach and point his finger in their face and say, Thou art the man. You, you had some experience with sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now of all the troubles that I know anything about, sin is the worst trouble a man can have. You may have troubles in your life, but if you have sin trouble, you really have trouble, my friend. There are some troubles in this world you can get out of. There are some troubles in this world a doctor can help you with. I suppose there are some troubles in this world that a psychologist can help you with. But when you have sin trouble, you have trouble that God Almighty alone can deal with. Now, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have some kind of trouble. Why, well, you can't get out of having trouble. That's ridiculous. Some people say, well, since I'm saved, my troubles are going to be over. No, sometimes when you receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, your troubles are just starting. Sometime when you take Christ as your Savior, friends in your family misunderstand. Your kinfolk, your relations. People close to you misunderstand you, misjudge you, or they may persecute you. Sometimes your troubles only begin when you become saved. But of all the troubles I know anything about, sin is the worst. Now you're going to have trouble. Christ said about Christians, while you're in the world, you'll have tribulation. Then he said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Uh, when my hair begins to fall out, I get it fixed. <laughs> then my teeth begin to fall out, I get them fixed. I lose my money. I get my money back. I lose my job. I get a new job. Why, about the time I get another job, the house burns down. I get me a new house. I have a car wreck. <laughs> I fix the car. Something else goes wrong. Maybe those things have never happened to me, but they've happened to some of you. They've happened to some of you. You have trouble. I have trouble. We all have trouble of some kind, but the worst trouble you ever had, my friend, is sin trouble. While you're in this world, you're going to have trouble. But if you have Jesus, he can help you bear your troubles. Whereas if you've never received him as your Savior, then you must bear them all alone. That's the difference. Everybody has trouble. Why, the biggest fool I'm talking to tonight is the man that tries to avoid trouble by doing the wrong thing. You're going to have trouble, my dear friend, whether you do the right thing or not. You might just as well make up your mind to do right and have trouble as do wrong. May God help you to receive Christ before this message is over so you can have somebody help you bear your trouble. And you people that have problems and troubles that are too heavy to bear, why don't you receive the Lord Jesus as your own personal Savior? He'll help you bear your burdens. 
There's no use trying to keep the skeletons in the closet covered up forever. Someday they'll get out. Yes, yeah, someday they'll get out and rattle all around the house. Now, why don't you do this? Why don't you take those troubles you have that nobody can help you with but God, and instead of telling somebody else about those troubles, why don't you take them and put them in a closet and lock the door and then take the key and give it to Jesus and say, Here, Jesus, I don't know what to do with these. You take them. Why, listen, he'll take that key and throw it over his back, and that'll be the end of it. And those skeletons will stay in the closet. They won't come out. Now look at this man here. He's having trouble with sin. Ladies and gentlemen, sin, sin is like a serpent. You have different kinds of serpents. You have serpents that can crush a man to death. You have serpents that can poison a man with a bite. You have harmless serpents. Why, sin, sin is like a serpent. It'll do some kind of damage. Even a snake that doesn't kill when it bites can leave a wound, an ugly stripe, or an ugly scar. And sin, sin is like a serpent. You take a boa constrictor, or an anaconda, or a python, why they can wrap their coils around a man, sometimes 20 feet in length, and crush that man, break him. Why a, a snake, some snake, can wrap around a man and take those muscles and constrict them, and when they draw those muscles in, the man's bones crush just like a berry basket. <laughs> just like that. That's a picture of sin. Sin is like a serpent. Sin is like a serpent. It'll get you. You'll fool around with it. You'll say everybody else does it. You'll say we always have done it. You'll say there's no harm in it. And the coils will grow tighter and tighter. And someday you'll say, I can stop anytime I want to. But that's because you never wanted to. And you'll say, I can quit this habit anytime I try to. And that's because you never tried. And that thing will get tighter and tighter and tighter. And it'll squeeze the very life out of you. Sin is like a serpent. One time when I preached down the rattlesnake country of southeast Alabama, I talked with an old farmer about snakes. He showed me a snake kit. The snake kit said if you get bit, suppose you're, suppose you're bitten on the wrist. He said, uh, do this. He said, get out your snake kit and follow instructions. And the instruction said, take a razor blade and cut two cross marks on each fang where the serpent bit. It said, put a tourniquet around your arm between the place where the snake bit you and your heart. And then it said, take that razor blade and make seven or eight cuts in your flesh, an eighth of an inch deep, to let blood, so you might not be poisoned. And when I heard that, I said to myself, if you're ever saved, it's by the cross. And when I heard about the letting of blood, I said to myself, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. The life of the flesh is in the blood. If you're ever saved, my friend, you'll be saved by the blood. Look at this man over here. He said, I'm smart. He said, I can get away with it. I'm a 20th century enlightened man. I have ways and means. I'm an advanced citizen. I am a man of high standing. I have evolved down through the centuries into a specimen of high culture, understanding, and enlightenment. This man said, yes, I'm a DD, or a BA, or an MA, or a PhD, or a Lit D, or a COD, or an XYZ, or an FOB. <laughs> this man said, I've got it made. I'm smart. I can beat the game. No, you can't beat the game. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, and sin has no more respect for a four-star general than a buck private. Sin has no more respect for a PhD than a high school freshman. Why, you say you're smart enough to get away with sin. Then you're smarter than any man that's ever lived on this earth. No man was ever smart enough to get away with sin. No man ever has been. No man ever will be. You say, oh yes, but I've read such and such. <laughs> Why, you poor fish, sitting there tonight, you're so bound by pride and egotism, you're as bound as any man that ever had sin's coils wrapped around his ribs, crushing him to death. You need deliverance from sin, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This man is hell in the bonds of sin. This man needs, he needs deliverance from sin. How is he going to find it? How is he going to find it? Watch, and perhaps we can find out from the Bible. Now, if all I drew for you today was the first part of this picture, if that's all I had to draw for you today, it wouldn't be hardly worth your time to sit and watch this telecast.
But thank God that's not the end of this picture. Let me draw you something else. The Bible says, He that committeth sin, he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. And then it turns right around and says, But if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. All right, if you commit sin, you're sin's servant. But Christ said, If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now understand what he said. He did not say that education will make you free. Men say, well, the trouble is with education. If you can just get a man's head right and enlighten him, he can straighten out. Now, any policeman will tell you that's not so. Some of the most brilliant men are the most wicked men. And some of the most ungodly, filthy, egotistical, proud, self-righteous, stubborn, wicked people that ever lived were educated people. The trouble is not in the head. The trouble is in the heart. Now, education can make you free after a fashion. Organizations and different groups of men can make you free somewhat. A church membership in the sacraments can make you free for a while. But the Bible says something entirely different. The Bible says, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, that's the kind of freedom you need. Christ said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Religion and philosophy may make you free temporarily. Education, good works, and reformation make you, may make you free to the eyes of your friends and your relatives and those that know you. But wait a minute. If the Son, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Men and women, that's the way to get deliverance from sin. That is the way to get deliverance from sin. You see, I'm drawing a picture here of the risen Lord. I'm drawing him as though he were transparent. I'm drawing him as though you could see right through him. Because the Bible says God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Do you see this two-edged sword he has? That two-edged sword is the word of God. Because the Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Do you see this? This is prayer. Because the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that, my friend, is how to get deliverance from sin. Call upon his name, believe his word. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And lest we Christian people should be wise in our own conceit, let me say this. Every Christian has a besetting sin. And we get deliverance from our sin the same way unsaved people get deliverance, through prayer and the word. For the Bible tells us to cast all our care upon him, for he cares for us. Now may God help you Christian people to read your Bibles and pray and love the Lord Jesus in sincerity and truth. And may God help you unsaved people listening to my voice right now to bow your head there by your television set and receive him as your Savior the best way you know how. He's risen, he's living, he loves you, he'll save you.